So in this video, I'm going to explain to you why I think that the current explanation for how the Olmecs move these colossal 20 to 50 ton basalt heads across bodies of water must be wrong and why we all need to rethink what ancient Americans were capable of. The Olmecs are perhaps ancient America's most inexplicable culture. They arrive on the archeological record as a fully formed civilization with a complete artistic style and a hierarchical society with identifiably different figures such as shamans, kings, ball players, babies, and even the strange were jaguar people who are depicted being carried as babies out of ancient caves or portals. And everything that I just listed warrants its own video. The shamans, the were jaguar people, the strange ball players, I'll even have more videos about the colossal heads, as well as all of the strange Olmec megaliths that I guarantee most people have never seen before. All of these topics will be getting their own videos this year as I really focus in on the Olmecs. But today though, I wanna focus on one of the most glaring of the Olmec mysteries, why I believe that the currently held explanation for how the Olmecs move these colossal basalt heads over 100 kilometers across vast bodies of water must be wrong. I will even try to provide some other evidence-based explanations. To begin, the first Olmec head was discovered by a Mexican man named Jose Maria in the late 1800s, but it wasn't until the early 1920s that archaeologists finally came around to giving this artifact a look. After explorer Franz Blom made the discovery of the Olmec twin statues in the Tuxla Mountains of Veracruz. When he publicized these finds, archaeologists quickly noted that these statues didn't resemble anything else seen anywhere in the Mesoamerican world. They were of a much different style than the known Maya, Zapotec, Aztec, Teotihuacano cultures. I should also note, notice the similarity between these Olmec headdresses and the traditional pharaonic headdresses. I'm not implying a cultural connection here, but I do find it very interesting that we see similar mysteries across cultures and the fact that no Egyptian or Olmec headdress or helmet has ever been found. In the 1930s, more Olmec heads would be discovered by Matthew Sterling and his wife, Marion Sterling. She would be the one to decipher the epi-Olmec glyphs that prove the Olmecs actually predate the Maya. And honestly, an entire movie could be made over this woman who lived amongst the swamps of Veracruz, uncovering the secrets of the Olmecs while hunting crocodiles to make a crocodile skin purse. I have no idea why there aren't more movies based around archaeology. By the end of the 1940s, Sterling had discovered seven Olmec heads ranging in size from 6 to over 40 tons. The heads seem to represent a ruling class, perhaps a king, but these kings are differentiated from the half-jaguar people and children depicted on the megalithic altars. The heads are also very likely portraits of different individuals, as each face has its own attributes and features that make them unique from each other. But with all of the secrets of the Olmec world that researchers are still trying to uncover, something that gets glossed over is that everyone, and I think archaeologists included, have quietly known for some time that the explanation for how these Olmec heads were moved across bodies of water is wrong. And I'm going to give an alternate explanation, something, it's not based in science fiction, it's very evidence-based by looking at other cultures in the ancient Americas that could have lived contemporaneously with the Olmecs. So of the 17 known basalt Olmec heads, the smallest head, Monument 4, weighs an estimated 6 tons, while the most recent data for the largest head, La Cobada, weighs a staggering 50 tons. Now, in previous videos, I've stated that the La Cobada head seems to weigh somewhere between 40 and 42 tons, but it seems like recent data coming out is now putting that estimate at around 50 or just over 50 tons. Furthermore, we know that Olmec monuments were carved only after they'd been transported to the location they were intended to be placed. Out in the jungles of Veracruz, I have seen the unused remnants of these Olmec monuments scattered about the jungle floor. The archaeological literature supports this as well. What this means is the Olmecs were transporting un finished stones for the heads that weighed potentially considerably more than they do today. So how exactly do archaeologists think that the Olmec heads were moved? Well, they suppose that the heads were moved using a combination of sledges, log rollers, and balsa river rafts. However, all of these assumptions are based on written chronicles of Spanish conquistadors in the Aztec heartland some 2,000 to 2,500 years later. In the early to mid 1500s, Spanish chroniclers did see Aztec people using wooden log rollers to transport extremely large stones. But can we really use a culture that lives in a similar geographical region to infer how a culture 2,000 
2,000 years earlier might have behaved? Well, potentially, in some cases. For instance, the Olmec Monument 19, depicting what is almost certainly the Mesoamerican feathered serpent, is estimated to have been erected somewhere around 900 BC give or take some 500 years. This is long before we see the first traditional depiction of Quetzalcoatl on the temple facades at Teotihuacan around 150 AD. When we look at the later Guatemalan Papil Maya culture, we see them trying to recreate the Olmec heads in their own but slightly different style. We also see the Olmec iconography and style of dress being passed down to the Maya and then to the later Aztecs as well. So in some cases, we can observe that traditions and ideas of civilization are passed down over the course of 2,000 years or more. But what about the Olmecs just dragging the stones? Well, of course, if they were using ropes, those would have deteriorated thousands of years ago. But there may be evidence for it. Two months ago, I was at the Museum of Mesoamerican History in Jalapa, Mexico. And while walking through the museum, I came across a monument depicting what appeared to be someone sitting on a carved block, wrapped with rope, and possibly being pulled. Now, whether this is depicting some form of ancient pelican, where an Olmec ruler sits on a solid block of basalt and is pulled from city to city by his subjects, nobody can really say for certain. But it is depicting ropes being tied around a large block probably for pulling the block from one location to another. Unless, again, there is a utility or purpose here that we can't comprehend, being 3,000 years disconnected from this culture. But I truly think that the most nebulous idea for how these Olmec heads were transported is by the traditional balsa river rafts. When you look at the study of the ancient Americas from a bird's eye view, it is believed that balsa river rafts that were built adequately enough to lift some of the smaller Olmec heads were actually first invented in the coastal city of Ecuador and Colombia and weren't introduced into Mexico and Central America until sometime after 100 BC. That is according to the hard archaeological evidence. Thor Heyerdahl, one of the America's most legendary archaeologists and explorers, actually theorizes that these balsa rafts were of such a high quality construction that they could have been used to sail across the entire Pacific Ocean. And if that sounds crazy, he actually did it just to prove it was possible. In 1947, he led an expedition on a raft named Contiki to demonstrate ancient American ingenuity and how these people from both Polynesia and South America could have been ocean-faring civilizations using these vassals. Contiki was constructed based on the historical accounts and depictions of traditional balsa rafts that the Spanish witnessed the Inca and other South American tribes using. It was made from balsa logs tied tightly together with hemp ropes. It also featured a cabin on the deck of the ship which was made from bamboo. Lastly, the sails were woven together with locally available indigenous materials. And on April 18, 1947, after 101 days at sea, Thor Heyerdahl successfully sailed Contiki from Peru across the Pacific Ocean, landing in Raroia Atoll in the Tuamotu Archipelago of French Polynesia. I probably butchered that horribly. And he proved that oceanic navigation on seemingly quote-unquote primitive but incredibly well-built balsa rafts was possible, which opens up Pandora's box to so many questions that are going to have to be addressed in later videos. Furthermore, according to the 1526 Spanish account of Bartolomé Ruiz, who was Pizarro's chief navigator, these boats had the capacity to support up to 10 to 30 tons of cargo. And contrary to what you might imagine, these quote-unquote rafts weren't a simple 10 by 10 foot construction. Literary sources tell us that these vassals could be up to 100 feet across and were built as robustly as many Spanish ships. So what's the problem here? Well, there are still two issues. First, the Olmecs are not thought to have had balsa river rafts that were nearly as sophisticated as what the Spanish encountered off the coast of South America. Furthermore, there isn't any archaeological evidence that the Olmecs ever actually had balsa river rafts. Archaeologists only come to this conclusion because looking at their vast trade networks as they had an abundance of jade which is typically found deep in Guatemala far from the Olmec heartland, we can infer that vast amounts of materials were being transported across Mesoamerica deep in the remote past. But if we don't have a precedence for river rafts in the Olmec world, well, how are materials being transported? Due to the immense weight of moving valuable trade goods across these vast distances through jungles, swamps, deserts, and mountain ranges of Mesoamerica, it seems highly unlikely that these materials were being traded entirely on foot. Basically impossible. One thing we have to consider is, as far as we know, sock bays, meaning white road in Maya, weren't constructed until the pre-classic 
period around 300 BC, after the height of the Olmecs. And these sock bays were ancient highway systems laid with white limestone rock that covered the Maya world, spanning hundreds or perhaps thousands of miles. These roads were built in areas with limited river systems to act as a quicker way to deliver and trade goods. And why is this? It's because the river was the ancient world's highway and the Olmec heartland is full of them. Like Egypt, the Olmec civilization sprouted because of its proximity to fresh water. Where Egypt civilization was made great because of its ability to produce grain on the Nile, the Olmecs were able to mass produce corn on four different major river systems, and thus they became Mesoamerica's first wealthy civilization. So now that we understand why they were using river systems, we come to our last problem. Again, the means by which we are told the Olmecs transported these colossal heads must be wrong. But that's a big claim, and rather than explaining it myself, I'm going to let an archaeologist with more than 30 years experience in Mesoamerica explain it to you. The way they hauled those basalt monuments to the site is perhaps the largest Olmec mystery that's still completely unsolved. Not all of the hundred plus monuments at the site were huge, but the colossal heads and the altars sure were. Scholars still debate how they managed to move them 80 kilometers through swamps to the city's ridgetop. Most textbooks say that they floated them upriver on massive rafts, but we've all quietly known that that's wrong. They're just too heavy for that. A few years back, I had the good fortune of traveling with a nautical engineer named Michael. He was intrigued by this Olmec raft theory, but unlike my colleagues and I, he had the skills to actually evaluate it mathematically. A few weeks after our trip, he sent me this amazing Excel chart with embedded formulas. You could enter the weight of your Olmec head and the size of the balsa wood raft you were using to transport it. Even with a raft made of tree trunks 50 feet wide, anything over 5 tons would sink it. We've all kinda always known that the raft idea wouldn't work. But Michael's Excel chart calculator proved it to me. He actually went even further to theorize what might work. He suggested instead of a raft, lashing logs to the heads vertically. It's a lot harder to push a log into a body of water vertically. That's a basic principle of Archimedes' law of buoyancy. Anyhow, Michael's smart investigation only supported the mystery. How did they move them? Overland transport remains the only possibility, and even that seems impossible in swampy marshes. Now, expanding on what Dr. Barnhart says here, if you were to build a primitive style balsa raft that was 50 feet long, an Olmec head weighing more than five tons would sink the raft. Well, there's two more problems here. Problem A, the smallest Olmec head is six tons, with the largest head now being estimated over 50 tons. Problem B, if you constructed a balsa raft 50 feet long, it would be too too large to travel down certain areas of the Olmec rivers and tributaries. And when we reach this point, it seems like there's absolutely no way that the colossal Olmec heads could have ever been transported by boat. They're too large, they're too heavy, and even the smallest head would sink a raft that's too long to sail down the river. And you could say that perhaps they weren't transported down rivers at all, but when you look at the Olmec heartland, it is littered with rivers and avoiding them becomes impossible. But when I was reading through a research paper detailing the find at a small Olmec site called El Rimolino. I found something very interesting that may explain this mystery. Not much is known about this site other than radiocarbon dates that seem to place it at the beginning of Olmec civilization during the San Lorenzo phase around 1200 BC, where, in 2008, an archaeological expedition led by Alfredo Calderon discovered the remnants of an ancient, highly flexible and durable asphalt that was still intact, lining the remnants of an Olmec canoe. Well, a canoe is a brand new discovery. Up to this point, the Olmecs have been thought to only have had balsa river rafts. But now we have canoes, a much more sophisticated vassal, as well as a sophisticated form of asphalt used to seal the boat's boards together. The discovery of this Olmec asphalt is not something I have ever seen spoken about before finding this short article online. Furthermore, it just shows how much of a delay there is between an archaeological discovery and when that discovery reaches the popular consensus or a popular audience. It also reminds reminds me of the discovery of Roman concrete and Amazonian terra preta. Both are ingenious inventions that still puzzle archaeologists who are trying to recreate these ancient compounds even today. So what is the answer as to how the Olmecs transported these colossal megalithic monuments across their rivers and tributaries? I would fare to say that it's very likely that the Olmecs were much farther along in their trade networks and boat building than they've currently been given credit for. We see this similar wear jaguar half-human, half-jaguar iconography appearing in the Olmec regions of Mesoamerica 
and in South America right around the same time, which I think indicates a much larger and more interconnected trade network and a vast exchange of ideas across the Americas going much farther back in time than is currently accepted. And I also think that there are very likely much, much more sophisticated Olmec boats that haven't been discovered yet, possibly buried deep within the banks along the rivers and tributaries of the Olmec heartland. But unfortunately, INA, Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, has a lot of ground to cover from archaeology in North Mexico to Mexico City at Teotihuacan and Templo Mayor, not to mention the shaft tombs in Western Mexico, and then the Zapotecs, Monte Alban, Mitla, Cholula, and even the hundreds of Maya cities scattered across Mexico. With almost all of these sites gaining more notoriety than anything in the Olmec world, Olmec research in the low swamps of Veracruz and Tabasco gets lit literally flown over, and doesn't receive the kind of funding that other more famous cultures and sites do. It's my opinion that the Olmecs were much more advanced, much further along, and much more sophisticated than they're currently given credit for. And that's not to say that archaeologists think that they were overly primitive or not sophisticated. I just think that there is much, much more to discover in the Olmec world. And as discoveries and archaeological excavations continue very, very slowly, I think that we're going to begin to realize just how sophisticated the Olmecs were. If you'd like to see all 17 basalt Olmec heads, as well as three other limestone Olmec heads that almost nobody talks about, as well as every single major megalith in Mexico, I'm leading a tour this December across the Olmec heartland and into Mexico City called Megalithic Mexico, where you are going to see monuments that can't even be found on the deepest, darkest rabbit holes on the internet. And trust me, I've tried. You'll also be there to help me research and photograph the Olmec world as I'm preparing to publish my very first book, which is about the Olmecs. I'm also going to be speaking at Cosmic Summit next weekend, June 15th and 16th, covering the many mysteries of Mesoamerica, including and especially the Olmecs. If you'd like to purchase an in-person or online ticket, I will leave a link in the description below. I'm trying to make the jump from part-time to going full-time on YouTube. I can't do that without your help, so if you enjoyed, all I ask is that you please like and subscribe for more. I'm Luke Caverns, and we'll see you next time.